Good morning, dear students. Uh, today we are going to solve October, November 2017, 1-1 paper. My name is Farhan Mazar and the course we are studying is Physics 5054. Let's start today's paper. On your screen, the first question we have is, which list contains only scalar quantities? Acceleration, displacement, velocity, these three are vectors. Distance, force, speed, uh, force is a vector. Force, force is a vector. The D option is length, mass, and speed. Length is scalar, mass is scalar, speed is scalar. So his question was where all the quantities are scalars. So D is the right choice. Length, mass, speed, they all are scalar. Question number, let me reduce the size so you can see the whole thing. A manufacturer measures the three dimensions of a wooden floor tile using three different instruments. The approximate dimensions of the tile are shown. The length is 0 0.4 meter. The width is 0 0.08 meter. And the thickness is 0 0.005 meter. You see the length is 0 0.4 meter. The width is 0 0.08 meter. And the thickness is 0 0.005 meter. The length 0 0.4 meter means uh, 40 centimeter. The width means eight centimeter, and the thickness is uh, 0.5 centimeter. So for 40 centimeter, the best instrument will be a meter rule. And uh, for eight centimeter, the best instrument will be a caliper. And for 0.5 centimeter, the best instrument will be a micrometer. So for length, use a meter rule. For thickness, use a micrometer. And for width, use a caliper. So it looks that A is a good choice. A is a good choice. Here we have question number three. Question number three is on your screen. The speed time graph represents a short journey. So here we have a speed time graph. On the y-axis, time is represented. On the y-axis, speed is represented. And you know this has a constant gradient. The gradient of this graph represents acceleration. So the acceleration is constant. And um, the speed is actually increasing, you know, it means that the speed is actually increasing. So when you represent uh, a body whose speed is gradually increasing on a distance time graph, it should be an increasing curve. You know, on the distance time graph, the options given here, they are distance time graph. There are four options. They all are distance time graph and the slope of the distance time graph is equal to the speed. And here, you know, the speed was gradually uniformly increasing. The speed was increasing. So on the distance time graph, because the slope of the distance time graph represents the speed, because in our situation, the speed was gradually increasing. So the slope of the distance time graph should also gradually increase. So it should be a, 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 an increasing curve. Uh, so, uh, increasing curve. So here we have a uh, increasing curve. So A looks the good choice. Question number three, A is the right choice. Here the distance time graph is a uh, increasing curve and the increasing curve uh, means that it's a distance time graph. It is an increasing curve. It means that the speed is gradually increasing. So A is the right choice, sir.
question number three. Hmm. An object travels for 20 seconds with a constant speed of 10 meter per second. For the next, next 10 seconds, it accelerates uniformly to 20 meter per second. What is the total distance traveled by the object in the 30 second? Okay, here we have the speed time graph of that journey. And you know, if you have the speed time graph, you can find the distance traveled. All you have to do is you have to find out the area under the speed time graph. The area under the speed time graph is equals to the distance traveled. If you look at this shape here, this shape is basically, uh, you know, uh, I will divide this shape into two parts. I will draw a line. If you have a hard copy, please draw a line here and a line here. So what we will do, we will draw a line here and we will draw a line here. So you see this 30 second journey, uh, we it's, it's speed time graph. We have divided it, it into two parts. The first part is a rectangle. Its area is length into width. The second part is a, uh, it's a trapezium. And the area of the trapezium, you know, is one by two into height of the trapezium into sum of its parallel sides. Okay, so area of the rectangle, this will be the length and this will be the width. The length will be 20 and the width will be 10. And in this trapezium, the height will be 10 and the the two parallel sides, one parallel side will be 10, the other parallel side will be 20. I've done this on a paper, let me show you my work. So I hope you can see that. Um, length multiplied width plus uh, uh, one by two into height into sum of parallel sides. So length is 10, the width is 20, plus one by two into height is 10, into uh, one parallel side is 10, the other parallel side is 20, you know? So it will be 200 plus five into 30, 200 plus 150, and the answer will be 350 meter. The answer will be 350 meter. I hope that you understand that how we have found the area under the speed time graph, and the area under the speed time graph is equals to the distance traveled by the body. So 350 meter was our answer. So it's the B choice, question number four. B choice is the answer, 350 meter. A skydiver falls at terminal velocity. He then opens his parachute. Which row gives the direction of the resultant force on the skydiver and the direction of the acceleration of the skydiver immediately after the parachute opens. When the parachute opens, he was, uh, you know, before opening the parachute, he was falling with the terminal velocity. When he was falling with the terminal velocity, it means that the air resistance acting on that parachutist and the weight of the parachutist, they are equal. The resultant force is zero. But what he did, he then opened his parachute. When he will open his parachute, his surface area will become very large so the result, the weight of the parachutist will still be the same, but because his surface area is very large, the air resistance, which is acting upward, that will become very large, more than his weight. So the upward uh, air resistance, uh, that will be more than his weight, which is downward. So there will be a resultant force in the upward direction. And when there will be a resultant force in upward direction, there will be an acceleration in the upward direction. So the resultant force will be in the upward direction and the acceleration will be also in the upward direction. And you know, this acceleration will actually cause breaks because he's moving downward, but acceleration is upward. So this acceleration is actually reduces his velocity. So he will slow down. So the right answer is that the resultant force is in upward direction and the acceleration is also in the upward direction. So D is the right choice. Question number five, D is the right, cho right choice. <clears throat> B 
the diagram shows two objects on a beam balance. The beam balance is in equilibrium. Which quantities may be different? When you have this beam balance, both these arms, and this is the pivot, both these moment arms, they are equal. So when the beam balance is in balance, and it means uh, that both these objects have the same mass, it means both these objects have the same weight, it means both these objects have the same moment about the pivot. So what can be different? Is this which quantity may be different? They might have different volumes. Which quantities may be different? The masses of the two objects? No, that's not possible. The moment about the pivot of the two objects? No, that is also not possible. The volumes of the two objects? Yes, that's possible. The volume of the objects in these pans, they, that can be different from each other, even when they, uh, this is, the thing is balanced. The weight of the two objects? No, they are equal. So C is the right choice, sir. Question number six, C is the right choice. The volume of the two objects can be different. Their mass cannot be different. Their weight cannot be different. The moment about the pivot cannot be different. The only thing which can be different is their, their volume might be different. A metal wire is suspended from a support and loads of different. So a metal wire is suspended from a support and loads of different masses are attached to the lower end. The table shows how the extension of the wire depends on the mass of the load. So here we have the mass and here we have the extensions when you hung these masses. So how much extension was uh, produced in that wire? Between which two val between which values of mass does the limit of proportionality lies? So you see here we have increased two kg. So how much is the extension? Zero point three five minus zero. So the extension is zero point three five. Here we have increased another two kg uh, in the load. So how much is the extension? You can check it. Point seven. Oh no, 0 0.7, 0 0.7 uh, minus 0.35. So the increase in the extension is again 0 0.35. So this, it from here the increase of the extension was 0 0.35. From here to here the increase in the extension is again 0 0.35. Okay. From here to here, check what is the increase in the extension. 1.05 minus 0 0.7. So what is the answer? 0 0.35. Here again, when you increase the weight from 4 kg to 6 kg, the increase in the extension is again 0 0.35. And let's check here. And uh, you know, uh, when you increase the mass from or weight from uh, 6 kg to 8 kg, so check what is the extension. The new length is one, on the new extension is 1.5 and minus, 1.05 it's 0 0.45 you see here the increase in the extension was 0 0.35 here the increase in the extension was 0 0.35 here the increase in the extension was 0 0.35 but here the increase in the extension is 0 0.45 it is uh, for it is the increase the increment in the extension uh, for the same increment in the load is now more. It is not as it was in the previous three steps. So it means that the limit of, prof limit of proportionality has been crossed. So the limit, of the limit of proportionality is between 6 kg and 8 kg. So C is the answer, sir. Question number seven, C is the option. I hope you have understood that how I have reached this decision. Okay. The diagram shows a mercury manometer connected to a gas container. 
The density of the mercury is 14,000 kg per meter cube. The gravitational field strength G is 10 Newton per kg. What is the pressure difference between the gas in the container and the atmosphere? Check what is the difference of height in or difference of height in levels of the mercury in both the limbs. So from the ground, the height of this mercury level in this limb is 0 0.60 from the ground the height of the mercury level in this limb is 0 0.20. So the difference of the levels, the difference of height in both the levels is 0 0.60 meter minus 0 0.20 meter. So that H is actually the difference of the, the gas pressure and the difference between the gas pressure and the atmospheric pressure. So I've done this on a paper, let me show you uh, my work. Okay, so here, here we go. I hope you can see that the height, the difference of the level of the height in both the mercury limbs is 0 0.60 minus 0 0.20. That will be 0 0.40 meter. If you want to write the convert the pressure into Pascal, so the formula is pressure is equal to rho g h, where rho is the density, g is the gravitational field strength, and h is the difference of the level in both the limbs. So it will be 14,000 into 10 into 0 0.40, and the answer will be 56,000 Pascal. 56,000 Pascal. So C is the right choice. 56,000 Pascal, you know, 56,000 Pascal. So C is the right choice. Question number eight, C is the right choice. Okay. An astronaut on the moon drops a toolbox of mass 3 kg. It falls from rest and its kinetic energy as it hits the surface is 0 0.96 joules. At which speed does the toolbox hit the surface of the moon? Its kinetic energy is given, you know, if you know the kinetic energy, we can find the speed at which it hits the ground. Uh, and the formula is kinetic energy is equal to 1 by 2 mv square. We have the kinetic energy, we have the mass, we can find the velocity. I've done this on a paper, let me show you that. I hope that it's visible to you. Mass is 3 kg, the kinetic energy is 0 0.96 joules. Kinetic energy formula is 1 by 2 mv square. Put the values there, 0 0.96 equals to 1 by 1 by 2 into 3 into v square. We want the value of the v square, so make it alone, make it the subject of the formula. So 2 into 0 0.96 divided by 3, the answer is 0 0.64. Take the square root on both the sides because we want the value of the v. So take square root on both the sides, the final answer will be v equals to 0 0.8 meter per second. So the question number nine, the velocity will be 0 0.8 meter per second. 0 0.8 meter per second. So D looks the right answer, sir. Question number nine, D is the right option. Question 10. A car travels a distance of 200 meter in 20 seconds. The engine of the car provides a driving force of 1000 newton what is the power output of the engine you know the power output of the engine is equals to the uh, work done divided by the time taken so you applied a force of 1000 newton and the body covered a distance of 200 meters in uh, 20 seconds so we can calculate the work done we know the applied force we know the distance covered in the direction of the force 1000 newton is the force and the distance covered is 200 meter so so force multiplied distance covered that will give us the work done and then i will divide it with the time taken to do that work and i will get the power i've done this on a paper let me show you my work so i hope you can see that power is equal to work done divided by time the work done is force into the distance traveled in the direction of the force divided by time so 1000 multiplied 20 divided by 20. So the final answer will be 10,000 watt. 10,000 uh, watt. I think I made some mistake here. Let me check that. 
20 second 200 meters and 20 second okay so i made a mistake here by mistake i wrote something wrong ah so this i, I said wrong 1000 multiplied 200 divided by 20 the distance traveled is 200 meters so it's written 1000 multiplied 200 divided by 20 and the final answer will be 10000 watt so the power is 10000 watt let's check 10000 watt oh d is the right choice 10000 watt d is the right choice i hope you have understood that how we have solved this A gas is heated in a closed container of constant volume. Underline this word, constant volume. So volume is not changing. What happens to the molecules of the gas? They collide with the walls with less force. No, no, that's not right. If you heated them, they will exert more force. They expand, the molecules don't expand. They move faster. Yes, when you raise their temperature, there's Kinetic energy increases, which means they are moving faster. They move further apart. No, that's not possible because their volume is not changing. So C looks the good answer, sir. They move faster. Question number 11, C is the right choice, sir. C is the right choice. They move faster. Scientists believe that smoke uh, sorry, uh, scientists believe that some lakes are shrinking because of ev evaporation. What increases the rate of evaporation? A decrease in the surface area, that's wrong. Um, a fall in the water temperature, that is also wrong. An increase in the depth of the lake, no, on the depth, the evaporation rate don't depend. Wind blowing across the surface, yes, that will increase when the wind will start flowing, the evaporation rate will become faster. So D is the right choice, sir. Very easy question. D is the right choice. Question number 12, D is the right choice. Wind blowing across the surface increases the rate of evaporation. Solid wax. So here we have solid wax is melted in a boiling tube. So we, we, we boiled it, we melted it. Sorry, not boiled it, we melted it. So it now this, the, and then allowed to cool. The graph shows the cooling curve. So this is the cooling curve. So here, the wax was basically in the liquid form. And then it started cooling. So when it will cool, obviously it will convert into solid form. So when, you know, when something it con is converting from liquid to solid, the cooling curve will become flat. That cooling curve will become until all the wax is solidified. Uh, till that time, the curve will remain horizontal. The temperature will not drop. What is happening between point X and Y? Here we have the liquid wax. Here we have the solid wax. So what is happening here? The liquid is converting into solid. So what we call that, that is called solidification. The liquid is at its boiling point. The liquid is turned to solid. Yes, the liquid is turned to solid. The solid has reached room temperature. The solid is turning to liquid. No, the liquid is basically turning to solid because we are cooling. No? So it was liquid, so it's converting into solid. So B looks the good choice, sir. Question number 13, B is the right choice. The liquid is turning to solid. I hope you have understood. During boiling and during melting, a substance either takes in energy or gives out energy. Which row gives the energy transfer corresponding to the change of state? So during boiling, the substance is supposed to absorb energy. And during melting, the substance is supposed to uh, absorb energy, take in energy. During boiling, the substance will take in energy. And during melting, the substance will take in energy. So D looks the good choice. Question number 14, D is the right choice. Sir. It's a very simple question. 
boiling, the energy is absorbed by the object, and during the melting, the energy is absorbed by the object. Okay, the the temperature of a 50 gram mass of metal is raised by 40 degrees centigrade. The specific heat capacity of the specific heat capacity of the metal is 0 0.40 joules per gram per degree centigrade. How much thermal energy is supplied? You know, when there is a change in the temperature, the, the amount of heat you can find by the formula, heat equals to mc delta theta. Heat equals to mc delta theta, where m is the mass of the metal, C is the specific heat capacity of the metal, and the delta theta means the change in the temperature. The change in the temperature is 40, the mass is 50 gram, and the specific heat capacity is 0 0.40 joules per gram per degree centigrade. So simply you have to put this in the formula. I've done this on a paper, let me show you my work. Heat is equals to mc delta theta. So m is 50 grams, c is 0 0.4, and the delta theta is 40. So just multiply, you will get 400 joules. Sorry, 800 joules. I said 400. It's 800 joules. So for question number 15, d is the right choice. I hope you have understood this numerical. So for 15, d is the right choice, 800 joules. In which substance is the conduction of thermal energy mainly due to the movement of electrons? In which substance is the conduction of thermal energy mainly due to the movement? Or this happens in metals. In, in which substance is the conduction of thermal energy mainly due to the movement of electrons? Air, ice, iron, water. So this, uh, this is called free electron diffusion, and this happens in very good conductors, for example, metals. Uh, the conduction is done by the free electron diffusion, where the free electrons move from the hot end of the metal to the cold end of the metal, and they take with them the thermal energy. So it's iron. This happens in iron, metal. So what was the choice? Iron C choice. Question number 16, C was the choice. Four similar metal plates are the same distance from a heater, uh, from a heater that emits infrared radiation. The plates are painted dull black, dull white, shiny black, and shiny white. Which plate absorbs the most radiation and which plate reflects the most radiation he is not saying emits the most radiation is saying reflects so you see the most radiation will be absorbed by the dull black color and it will be most reflected by the shiny and white so absorb most radiation dull black and the reflects more radiation is by the shiny white so for question number 17, B looks the right answer, sir. B is the right answer. Absorbs most radiation, dull black. Reflects most radiation, shiny white. B is the right answer. Shrink the size. Here we are. Uh, a wave is traveling in water in a glass sided tank. The diagram shows uh, a side view of the wave at one instant. What are the amplitude and the wavelength of the wave? You know, amplitude means amplitude means uh, the wave has crust and troughs. So from the mean position, how high is the is the crust? And from the mean position, how deep is the trough? So from the mean position, how high you went in the crust? So that is the 
amplitude. So the amplitude is uh, four centimeter. Wavelength means uh, the distance between the two points which are in the same phase in a wave. Two consecutive points which are in the same phase. So for example, from mean, uh, from peak to peak, or from crust to crust, or from trough to trough. So here the half wave is shown, that's five centimeters. So full wave will be 10 centimeters. Be careful, okay? So wavelength will be 10 centimeters and the amplitude is four centimeters. So B looks the right choice, sir. Question number 18, B is the right choice. An earthquake, earthquake wave travels through the solid surface of the earth from east to west. So the wave is going from east to west. The solid surface vibrates in north-south direction. You see the, the wave is going from east to west, but the particles are vibrating from south to north, north to south, north to south. So you see the particles of the medium, they are vibrating perpendicular to the direction of the wave. If the particles of the medium, they vibrate perpendicular to the direction of the wave, the wave is a transverse wave. How can the earthquake wave be described? Electromagnetic? No. Longitudinal? No. Sound? No. Transverse? Yes. Why transverse? Because here the particles of the medium, they are vibrating north to south and the wave is going from east to west. You see the direction of the wave and the direction of the particles of the medium, the vibration of the particles of the medium, they are perpendicular to each other. So this happens in transverse waves. So D is the right choice. Question number 19, D is the right choice. So here we have a solid plastic cylinder is immersed in a liquid of refractive index 1.4. Light traveling in the plastic cylinder strikes the inside surface at an angle of incidence of 70 degree. The light undergoes total internal reflection. What are the values of the critical angle in the plastic and the refractive index of the plastic? You know this here, the total internal reflection has taken place. It means that the angle of incidence right now, which is 70 degree, is more than the critical angle. So it means that the critical angle is less than 70. So the critical angle is less than 70. The angle of incidence is definitely more than the critical angle. That's why the process of total internal reflection has taken place. Another very important factor which you should remember, the uh, the medium in which the light is traveling, it should be dense and uh, the medium who, from whose boundary it is reflected, it should be rare. Light should be traveling in the dense medium and it should be totally, then it will be totally internally reflected. Then it's possible that the process of total internal reflection takes place. So the outer medium will have less refractive index, the inner medium in which the light is actually traveling it should have more refractive index. So the refractive index of the plastic cylinder should be greater than 1.4, but the refractive and the critical angle is less than 70. So C looks the good choice, sir. Question number 20, C is the right choice. So you see, in this question, you will be only able to give the correct answer. If you know the conditions, uh, necessary conditions for the process of total internal reflection. The angle of incidence should be more than the critical angle. And the light must be traveling in optically dense medium and it will be reflected from the boundary of a optically dense medium. In other words, the inner material will have uh, more uh, refractive index. We call it optically dense. And the outer material will have less, uh, it will be rare. It will have less refractive index 
as compared to the inner material. So I hope you have understood. Here we go. We have the next question. So he says, what is the name and the shape of the lens used to correct short sight? For short sight, for example, I'm also short sight. I cannot see the far away objects clearly, but near objects I can see clearly. And the, the lens which is in my glasses, my spectacles, they are diverging. They are diverging. Okay. So C is the good choice. Sir. Question number 21, C is the good choice for short sighted for people. To correct that, we use diverging lens. So C is the right option. Question number 21, C is the right option. So here we go. Question number 22 on your screen, an object is placed in front of a converging lens. The lens forms a magnified image of the object on a screen. When the, Im the image is formed on a screen, it means it's a real image. Which statement is correct? The distance between the object and the lens is greater than the focal length. You know, when you put um, an object, it's a fact, you should remember this. When you put an object uh, between F and 2F, if you put an object in front of a, a convex mirror a lens at between 2F and F, the image formed will be magnified. The image formed will be real. Okay, that's a fact. You should remember this. The distance between the object and the lens is greater than the focal length. That's the answer. The image formed is a virtual image. That's wrong. The image is virtual right up way. Right way up, that is also wrong. The lens is acting as a magnifying, that is totally wrong. When the converging lens acts as a magnifying glass, the image formed is virtual. It cannot be obtained on a screen. So this is not that example. Here, the image formed is real. It is obtained on a screen, it's magnified. It means he has, he has placed the object between 2F and F from a lens. So A is the good choice, sir. Question number 22, A is the right choice. The distance between the object and the lens is greater than the focal length. A type of electromagnetic radiation passes the following properties. Sorry, possesses the following properties. It is ionizing. Its frequency is higher than the frequency of the microwaves. It is not detected by the human eye. It's electromagnetic radiation. What is this radiation? Gamma rays, that is electromagnetic radiation. It could be the answer. Infrared, infrared is electromagnetic, but it's not uh, ionizing. Uh, light, light is electromagnetic radiation, but it do not do the ionizing. Radio waves, uh, they are also electromagnetic but they do not do the ionizing thing. So for question number 23, A looks the good choice, sir. Gamma rays are electromagnetic waves and they do the ionizing power. And their frequency is very high as compared to microwaves and they cannot be detected by the human eye. So gamma rays is the answer, sir, A choice. Question number 23, A is the right choice. So here we have question number 24 is on your screen. Which, which row gives the speed of sound in air, in water and in steam? You know, the speed of sound in air is very slow. Speed in, in water will be fast. And the speed of the sound will be fastest in the solid. So in, in the gas, it is slow. In, what, in liquid, it is fast. And in the solid it is fastest fastest so speed in air of the sound is 330 that's true speed in water is 1500 that's also true the speed in steel is 6000 meter per second that is also true so a is the choice sir question number 24 a is the right choice
as a sound wave wave travels from one medium to another its wavelength increases what happens to the frequency and to the speed of the sound you know the wavelength of the sound uh, sound wave has increased nothing will happen to the frequency but the speed of the sound wave will also increase if the wavelength will increase the speed will also increase but the frequency will remain unchanged it will remain the cost it will remain constant so for question number 25, D looks the right answer, sir. Frequency stays the constant and the speed will increase. That's a fact. The frequency will remain constant. It will not change, but the speed will increase because the wavelength has increased. the diagram shows the pattern and the direction of the magnetic field between the two magnetic poles x and y which type of poles are you see here the magnetic lines are coming out from y the magnetic lines are coming out and in x the magnetic lines are going in so it means that the y is the north pole from north pole the magnetic lines come out and x is the south pole where the magnetic lines are going in so y is the north pole and x is the south pole so c looks the good option sir question number 26 c is the right option y is north pole and x is south pole c is the right option question number 26 c is the right option The diagram shows a sensitive device surrounded by a shield that prevents the magnetic field from reaching the device. What does the shield protect the device? Sorry, how does the shield protect the device? You see what will happen, these magnetic lines, they will flow through this uh, shield and from here they will exit. The magnetic lines, they will flow through this shield and they will exit from here they will not reach this device so the shield is basically providing them the path for the magnetic field lines and from the other end it let them go it channels the magnetic field around the shield until it emerges on the right hand side that is the right answer b is its left hand side absorbs the magnetic field no its left hand side reflects the magnetic field lines no its left hand side scatter the magnetic field line in one direction that is also wrong so a is the only good option sir a is the right option it channels the magnetic field around the shield in until it emerges on the right hand side i told you that from here the magnetic line will enter and they will travel in this shield in the material of the shield and from here they will exit simple this is called magnetic shielding no magnetic lines will reach this device. So this device is uh, safe from uh, stray magnetic fields. Here we have. A polythene rod is charged by rubbing it with a cloth. So you see before charging, here we have a polythene rod, here we have a cloth. And after charging, the polythene rod has become negative, the cloth has become positive. What does this mean? It means that when you rub them with each other, the electrons from the cloth has traveled to this polythene rod. So due to excess of electrons, this polythene rod has become negative. And because here electrons have gone, so here we have deficiency of electrons, so this will become positively charged. Which statement explains why the cloth is charged? A, electrons move from the cloth to the rod. That's the right choice, sir. That's why the cloth is positive and the rod is negative. B's electron moves from the rod to the cloth. That's not true. Protons move from the cloth to the rod. Proton never move. Protons move from the rod to the cloth. The proton never, never, never moves. So A looks the good choice, sir. Question number 28, A is the right choice electron move from the cloth to the rod that's why the cloth has lost electrons it has become positive the rod has uh, gained electrons so that has become negative
what is electromotive force emf uh, electromotive force is the amount of work done to move the unit charge in a closed circuit amount of work done to move the unit charge so work done divided by charge work done divided by charge so c looks the good choice sir question number 29 c is the right choice question number 29 c is the right choice work done divided by charge is equals to emf In a circuit, a voltmeter is used to measure the potential difference across a lamp. An ammeter is used to measure the current in the lamp. Which diagram shows the circuit? You know, if you want to measure the voltage drop across a lamp, you should connect a voltmeter parallel to the lamp. And if you want to know how much current is flowing through the lamp, you should connect the ammeter in series with the lamp. So only in the figure B, the voltmeter is connected parallel to the lamp and the ammeter is connected in series with the lamp so that is the right connection sir b is the right option b question number 30 b is the right option the voltmeter is connected in parallel to the lamp and ammeter is connected in series with the lamp b is the right choice The battery in a circuit contains two identical cells connected in parallel. Which row shows the relationship between the current I1 and I2 and gives the electromotive force of the battery? You know, these two cells, they are connected parallel to each other. So the total EMF or total voltage of this battery will be only two volt. They do not add up. Their EM, EMF do not add up when you connect them in parallel. So the total, uh, voltage here will be only 2 volt so the emf is 2 volt so the current coming out of the battery is i1 so the current going back to the battery i2 they should be equals to each other that's the rule of this game then the current coming from the battery and current going back to the battery they should be equal so i1 and i2 should be equal so it means that i1 and i2 they are equal and the emf is 2 volt so C looks the choice, sir. Question number 31, C is the right choice. Question number 31, C is the right choice. The diagram shows the circuit for a hair dryer. So here, this switch P, when you close it, this fan motor will work. If you choose close Q, this heater will work. If you choose, close this R, this heater will work. The fan motor has a power rating of 0.1 kilowatt and the heater each have a rating of 0.40 kilowatt. The cost of electricity is 8 cents per kilowatt hour. What is the cost of running the hair dryer for 2 hours? The time is 2 hours. With the switches P and Q closed and switch R open. If you close this, the fan will be working. And if you close Q, the heater will be working. If you keep it open, this heater is not working. So one heater and one fan are working and they, they, they were working for two hours. So the question is, how much is the bill of the electric? How much is the charges of the electric? How much is the bill? So I've done this on a paper. Let me show you my work. So here we go. The cost is equal to power multiplied time, multiplied price per kilowatt. The total power, the motor and the fan, 0 0.1 is motor and the heater, sorry, 0 0.1 plus 0 0.4. Kilowatts. They, this power should be taken in kilowatts. So both of them are given in kilowatt. So the power is 0 0.5 kilowatt, and the time is two hours, and the price per kilowatt hour is eight cents. So you multiply them, the final answer will be eight cents. The final answer is eight cents. So D is the right option, sir. Eight cent. D is the right option. D is the right option, sir. Why are the metal casings of electric appliances earth? You know why we earth it? Because if, God forbid, 
sometimes what happen that the live wires which are taking current inside the appliance to the machinery of the appliance what happens their insulation breaks and the live wire becomes exposed and that that live wire comes in contact with the casing and the live current starts going into the casing so to us for the safety purpose what we do we connect earth wires so those earth wires take the current if if the casing becomes live if the casing of the machine or appliance becomes live the earth wire takes the current it's the resistance of the earth wire is less than the resistance of the human body so it will take the current to the ground uh, because its resistance is less than the human body so the, if the human comes in contact with the casing they will not be electrocuted why are the metal casings of electrical appliances earth to complete the circuit no to ensure the casing is not at a dangerous voltage that could be the answer to ensure the fuse blows when the current in the appliance is too large to protect the appliance from overheating no so b looks the good option sir question number 33 b is the right option to ensure the casing is not at a dangerous voltage if the voltage is in the casing or the high live current is in the casing through the air uh, through the sorry earth wire it will go into the ground Here we have. The diagram shows a wire XY lying between the poles of a magnet. The ends of the wire are connected to a sensitive ammeter. The wire is moved and a reading is registered. In which direction is the wire move? You know, uh, this is the. Uh, you all if you put a conductor uh, in a magnetic field and if you want the electricity to be produced if you want emf to be induced what we do we move the conductor perpendicular to the magnetic field we place the conductor perpendicular to the magnetic field and we also move it perpendicular to the magnetic field we do not move parallel to the magnetic field we move it perpendicular to the magnetic field so the magnetic field is from north to south the conductor is placed uh, like this so it should either go up or it should go down so a is the right choice sir it should be moving perpendicular to the magnetic line so it can cut them so a looks the good option sir question number 34 a is the right option which particles are emitted by a hot metal filament from the hot metal filament electrons are given out we call it thermonic emission this happens in the topic of the cro cathode ray oscilloscope when you have a hot metal filament electrons are given out this is called thermonic emission electrons are given out so b is the choice question number 35 b is the right choice A light emitting diode LED is connected to an alternating current AC supply. The LED flashes on and off. What is the direction of the current in the LED when it emits light? You see, you have connected here we have the LED, light emitting diode, and here we have the alternating uh, uh, power supply. So once the current will flow in this direction, and then the current will flow in this direction. Once it will flow anti-clockwise, then it will flow clockwise in this uh, in this circuit. So when the current will be flowing in anti-clockwise direction, it will be the diode will be forward biased because the direction of the current and the arrow of the diode they will have the same direction. So we call it forward biased. So LED will give out light. But when the current will flow in this direction, you can say in anti-clockwise sorry in clockwise direction. 
the direction of the current and the arrow of the led they will be in the opposite direction the resistance of the led becomes very very high it do not let the current flow through it so no led do not give out light so what is the direction of the current in the led when it emits light i told you it should be according to this arrow it should be towards right towards the right only so b looks the good option sir question number 36 b is the right option this led will light when the current will be going from left to right then the led will be in the forward biased if the current will come in the opposite direction the led will be backward biased with that current so no light will be given out so b is the right option sir a narrow beam of alpha particles is fired at a thin piece of gold foil what is the final direction of the largest number of alpha particles this is the martsen experiment if you have the alpha particle coming this is the gold foil most of the alpha particles went straight undeflected most of the alpha particles in the martsen experiment went straight because most of the atoms are empty space so a is the right choice sir question number 37 a is the right choice a nucleus of phosphorus 3215 emits a beta particle to form a new nucleus what is the nucleon number and what is the proton number of the new nucleus whenever a beta particle is given out the daughter nucleus will have one proton number uh, increased by one and its nucleon number will remain unchanged whenever a beta particle is given out a beta decay happens the daughter nucleus its proton number will be one more than the proton number of the parent nucleus but its nucleon number will remain unchanged so the nucleon number should be still the 32 but the proton number should increase by one so it should become 16 so d is the right choice sir question number 38 d is the right choice d is the right choice question number 39 how does a nucleus of the isotope chlorine 37 differ differ from a nucleus of the isotope chlorine 35 so he's talking about the difference in the nucleus so both these uh, chlorines they are the isotopes of each other as they have the same number of protons but they have different nucleon numbers if the proton number is same why the nucleon numbers are different because they have num different number of neutrons so this chlorine 37 has two more neutrons so c is the right choice sir question number 39 c is the right choice this was a easy one it contains two more neutrons c is the right choice which type of radiation may be emitted by radioactive decay it could be alpha particles it could be beta particles it could be gamma rays okay a choice is alpha particles and gamma rays yes that's possible b microwaves and infrared no they they are not radiations from a radioactive decay c radio waves and microwaves they are not emitted by radioactive decay ultraviolet and x rays they are not emitted by radioactive decay so only alpha particles and gamma rays they are these are the correct radiations which come out in the result of radioactive decay so a looks the good option sir radio alpha particles and gamma rays are uh, the types of radiation may be may be emitted by radioactive decay alpha particles and gamma rays a looks the good option question number 
A is the right option. Dear students, by this question, we have reached the end of this paper. My dear students, today we have done October, November 2017, one month paper. The course we are studying is Physics 5054. My name is Farhan Mazhar. I hope that these videos are helping you. They are helping you to improve your concepts of physics. I hope they will benefit you and you will improve your answering skills. Thank you very much, everybody. Have